literate communities. Who can give me a definition for literate? Able to read. They can read. What do you think that has to do with Bible translation? Yeah, we, we think a lot about some of the prominent parts of ABT, um, Bible translation, obviously. Um, and the vision behind that, it's a vision something like communities of indigenous believers, believers in every language, living out the Word of God. But to do, to do that, they need the Word of God in a comprehensible way, a way that they can access. And And so there's more. There's more than Bible translation. And in fact, as we do things like Bible translation, we're trying to bring the Word of God and make it accessible to them. Access, keyword. But more than that, we want them to have that access. We want them to learn and understand and comprehend. And we want them to live it out. That, that's what our God is about. His will being lived out among people who are in relationship with Him. That's what we're about. Um, and so we're also about church planting, Bible translation and church planting. And we talk about other things too. I want to just take a few moments to focus on literacy, learning to read. That's uh, probably for most of us, that's somewhere far back in our history. Uh, we can hardly remember when we couldn't read. You know, I mentioned this morning how because of Isaiah's faithfulness in proclaiming the word of the Lord, millions of people today, including us, have been blessed by that faithfulness of Isaiah. Now, how, how did that blessing come to you? you? You read it, right? There's a... There's a question today, a, re a real question, and that is, how important is literacy and being able to read? You see, there's a lot of places, a lot of nations and peoples who, whose whole culture is built around, well, not being able to read, and it, it's an oral culture, culture that thinks and communicates orally and with oral styles and people are asking, can we even do, you know, we have to bring them God's word. Can we, can we even bring them God's word without actually, you know, writing it down? Can it be all oral somehow where, where we go through these processes of speaking and, and, and recording and, and not actually getting the text? Well, I want to contend that God designed that he intended a written communication. So we're, we're backing up here a little bit. We're thinking about the question of literacy. And we want to just understand how important is this to God? I would contend that God intended written communication, that specific abstract communication of ideas, facts, instructions was designed by God, especially for his communication with mankind especially for that purpose. And what we're going to do today for just a few minutes is take a tour through the Bible and look at how the Scripture bears testimony. To, you know what Scripture means? It means writing. So <laughs> see how the Scripture bears testimony to that. And then we'll take just a few minutes. I'm going to have uh, Sister Ayana come up here after a little bit. And she is training as a literacy consultant, she's kind of leading the charge for ABT and they're developing understanding of how to do literacy. And she'll come and talk about that for just a few minutes. So we, we will move quickly here. I want to just go back a little bit to the beginning of the history of writing, the history of the alphabet specifically. The alphabet seems to have begun with Semitic languages around the time of Moses. You heard that term Semitic languages earlier this afternoon, right? About things like Arabic, Hebrew. Um, so who are some of the speakers 
of Semitic languages? The Jews, right? Like Moses. It seems to have originated in the uh, area of the Levant, where Israel is, Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, around the second millennium BC. And it's traced, it seems to have been developed by the Semitic speaking, this is the way Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article says it, the Semitic speaking workers in Egypt. You ever hear of those before? <laughs> And it seems to have been influenced by the older Egyptian style of writing, uh, the hieroglyphic or something similar. Paul Shirk said recently that uh, with modern research, it's largely becoming irrefutable that the art alphabet began with the Jews. And just uh, I'm just summarizing here, but let's, let's keep going. What, what, what is all this about? What are we coming to? Well, the Ten Commandments were given on Mount Sinai. They were written down. God wrote them down. What language did he use? What alphabet did he use? So this man, Moses, he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians those Egyptians who invented the compl complicated writing system of hieroglyphics. Moses himself may be the one who developed that first simple alphabet. So instead of this complicated system of, of, of sort of pictures and symbols with hundreds or thousands of, of pieces to it, it this, the alphabet reduced it to a, you know, 20 several symbols that were able to be, where you were able to communicate precisely um, anything. Why was God's law recorded when it was? God prepared his people to record his laws. He took them to Israel for, I mean, to Egypt, for more, than, more reasons than what might appear on the surface. What maybe he had in mind that in Egypt, someone like Moses would get all that learning, and all that training, about writing and be able to develop it into uh, an alphabet. The significant thing is that it appears that God waited to record his laws until he could do so with precision, until there was actually an alphabet where his laws could be written down precisely and communicated. We see the wisdom of God in relying not only on people, not only on oral communication for the communication of his message to mankind. He wrote it down. Okay. I said that I believe God in, intended, God designed specific abstract communication of ideas, facts, and instructions. What is written communication? Communicating by writing, what does it consist of? I think it, it consists in the thoughts of one person, written down, read and understood by someone else. And this is written communication. Okay, let's take a look at each of those four points. Thinking. When we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about God's thoughts being written down. Preserved God's thoughts for us. Centuries later, millennia later, we're still reading those same thoughts from God, his thoughts. The New Testament writers bear testimony to the fact that what was written before is God's thought. They demonstrate the legitimacy or the origin of the message that it came from God. They do that by quoting the prophecies and showing how they were fulfilled and things like that. Jesus appealed to the authority of what was written, showing us that this is God's thoughts that is recorded for us. And Satan knew that. Writing preserves thoughts. Peter said, my purpose in writing is to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So that, in one sense, he being dead yet speaketh. 
Also, David, in 2 Chronicles 29, they were singing praise to God with psalms written by David. So here's centuries after David died, he's leading the people in worship. It's his words, his thoughts. David's praises became their praises. Okay, the thoughts of another written down. Let's, let's see what the scripture says about writing. We've already considered the, the moral code, the, new, the uh, Ten Commandments, written down. Deuteronomy tells us, that, tells us this, when he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll. The king, when a king would come along in Israel, this is what he was to do. He was to write for himself the record of God's law. And so the same message is being recorded and passed across generations. Jeremiah, he wrote a letter to the captives in Babylon. And this was a way that God's message could reach across the miles. And in another instance, Jeremiah wrote some of what God had said and sent it. It got, sent, it got brought before the king and read to him. And so the message because it was written, it could go to places where Jeremiah himself couldn't go. The, we're looking at the versatility, the, the tool of writing, and how it can do so much more than depending on people always to be the communicators. God intended writing. When our collective conscience is seared, what do we need to do to bring it back to moral absolutes? Written, recorded law. And not just written, but read. When the, the, the law was written, but it was lost. And it was hidden in that temple for many years, right? Do you remember that story? And then in Josiah's day, they uncovered it. They found it. They opened it. And they read it. And they said, great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us. And they repented. Because they read. In Ezra's day, on the reading of the law, they wept when they heard, when they heard it. The king that we read about from Deuteronomy, he was supposed to make himself a copy. And what was he going to do with that copy? He was supposed to read in it all the days of his life. How are we going to understand God's wisdom, God's righteousness and justice, unless we read his law? And again, Joshua himself, the leader, was to do the same. Then we're told in Joshua that the exact same message that was given to Moses was passed on and received by another generation because it had been written down and recorded. Paul wrote letters, and he told them, after you read this letter, have it read to the other church. And we know that that was the pattern for all of those letters. The message could be shared, it could be passed on in writing. Now, just because you can read doesn't always mean that written communication is happening. Belshazzar knew how to read, but he didn't know what the point was when that hand was writing on the wall. There's something here for me, my people in my day, he wasn't sure what it was. Comprehension. Another man was driving through the desert and reading. He was reading probably a translation of the Old Testament of Isaiah, probably into his Greek language that he could understand. So it was translated, but he was not getting it. You know, the Ethiopian. Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? How can I? Unless some man help me. Which points us to the reality that not only does it need to be in familiar language, when we're speaking of the scripture of God, uh, the word of God, it needs to be read and it needs to be taught for full comprehension. The Jews could read too. <coughs> Jesus told them, search the scriptures. In them you think you have life. They're what testifies of me. Read. And yet, Paul said that when they read, there's a veil over their minds. 
Maybe the Bereans were more literate. They searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. They read with comprehension. So I'm, I'm proposing that literacy is intended by God. He intended and designed written communication. The thoughts of one person written down, read and comprehended by someone else. Or we can simplify. If we really want to know what God thinks about writing and how important it is, we know these things, don't we? We know that God is the author of languages. He started language. He wants everyone to be saved, and he gave his message in written form. God intends to communicate his thoughts through the written word. For this, they must be able to read with clear comprehension. That's why we think literacy is worth the effort. That's why we want to include literacy work in every project, in every Bible translation. A low level of literacy, you know, just barely able to comprehend, barely able to read, it's not going to be sufficient. And, Ayana, I'm ready for you to come and talk about the literacy program. You can just hold this thing up. Yeah, that might be best. If you prefer. Thank you. Well, before I talk about reading and how you teach it, I'd like to talk a little bit about s'mores and the very best way to make a s'more. Growing up, you, you get a campfire and you gather your graham crackers and your marshmallows and your peanut butter, sit down with friends, you toast the marshmallows on a, on a real long stick over the fire, and when they're done, you put them on the chocolate and the crackers, and oh, it's so good. Maybe not for you, but it sure is yummy. Well, what do you do when you're out at SIL? This really happened. And somebody's got all the ingredients to make a s'more, but there is no campfire, and you cannot legally start one anywhere nearby. What is the best way to make a s'more then? Well, we discovered one way that really works is to put the marshmallow on a fork and hold it over the burner in the little kitchen and be careful that you don't twist your fingers as well. And you can actually make a s'more really well that way too. What does that have to do with reading and writing? Simply this, there's a lot of different ways. There's a lot of discussion about the best way to teach reading and writing. But the best way to teach it is going to depend on where you are, who you're working with, what you have available. Um, for, for the context where ABT is looking at working, it's focused primarily on adult education for people who don't really have a background of reading and writing. If they do, it's sketchy at best. So how is the best way to do it there? What, what's been recommended is the syllable method. Yes, and here's the other thing I need. Syllables, you can think of a little bit like Legos. It's like a Lego is the building block of a Lego car. A syllable is the building block of a word, of a sentence, of a paragraph. But how do you explain a syllable without the letter? Well, one, one way they explained it is as sound tracks. You know, if you see deer tracks in the mud, you can say, what passed here recently? A deer, thank you. If you see W tracks on the board, you can say, oh, there went a whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, we are looking to find ways that are most effective to empower people in their context. Even, even the secular world gets the importance of empowerment. Um, one of the former US presidents said, an education is important. Without it, a man might rob a train car, and with it, he can steal the whole railroad. So we're not just looking for empowerment for its own sake. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Aaron covered this really well. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. And that is the kind of empowerment we're looking for as we, as we cast a vision as we craft writing systems, working with local people, developing curriculum, starting classes, training teachers, the goal is not simply to empower, but to disciple, to walk along together and teach, just little by little, as life gives the opportunities, able men and women who are going to be able to, in turn, teach.
teach and disciple others so that the church can be built up and edified.